Hello there and welcome back to this course on bilingualism. In this video I want to talk about cognitive effects. So does being bilingual make you a smarter person? Or can learning a new language protect you from dementia? That would be great, right? So let's investigate this. Uh, we look at experiments and empirical findings that are described in chapter 9 of Grosjean and Lee's The Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism. Let's get started with a little puzzle. So it doesn't matter whether you're monolingual, bilingual, multilingual. Try this. So you see a grid with squares in different colors and there are two squares missing. And your task is to find out the right colors for these two squares. Yeah? Okay, if you want to do this, um, pause the video here, time yourself, yeah? figure out the right answer, put them down in the comments and um, let us know what the right answer is, what your time is, and also what your different languages are, so that we know whether bilinguals are better at this sort of thing than monolinguals. All right, um, have fun. Now, um, to get us started, I want to mention that bilingualism hasn't always had the greatest of reputations. In fact, there was an early assumption to the effect that bilingualism is actually bad for you. So an early study argued that bilingualism leads to confusion and even mental retardation. This was not just based on wild theorizing, but rather it was based on empirical observation. So there was a large scale IQ test with more than a thousand school children showing that bilingual children scored significantly worse than monolingual children. Well, that's serious. Yeah? And to make matters worse, these results were then replicated with university students. And that shows that whatever problem is there in childhood, that actually persists uh, throughout later stages in life. So this meant that bilingualism was thought to lead to permanent cognitive damage. And that, of course, is pretty damning. Now, you notice that this study is almost 100 years old, and since then it has been criticized and largely discarded. Yeah? So there were a number of methodological problems associated with this. The bilinguals in the sample came from a lower socioeconomic background. So socioeconomic background was simply a confound, a confounding variable that was not properly controlled for, and it means that the lower IQ scores may be due to lower economic status. So that explains at least part of the difference that we see in the data. Also, the bilinguals had to do the IQ test in their weaker language, and you can imagine that that doesn't really make for objective testing. So the lower IQ scores may also be due to lower proficiency. And then things like balancedness were not properly controlled. In earlier videos, I mentioned that you don't really find two bilinguals that are exactly the same. Balancedness is different across different bilinguals. And this means that the lower IQ scores may be representative of some bilinguals, but certainly not of all of them. All in all, these results are distorted and misleading and have been uh, discarded. Yeah, um, That doesn't mean that bilingualism doesn't come with its own set of challenges. Um, so for one thing, bilingual children have to learn twice as many words as monolingual children. And that, of course, well, that, that has consequences. Namely, bilingual children know fewer words per language than monolingual children. That's what you see in this graph. The bilingual children, that's the dotted line, and the monolingual children, well, their vocabulary sizes that is the solid line above that. <clears throat> and so even by age 10, the bilinguals are not catching up with the vocabulary sizes of the monolinguals. Right. Um, now the change with regard to attitudes towards bilingualism really came with a classic study by Peel and Lambert in 1962. They did IQ tests with bilingual and monolingual children in Montreal um, and they basically expected to just confirm earlier findings that there's a disadvantage for bilingual children, but to their surprise, they found the opposite. Yeah? Bilingual children outperformed monolinguals in, linguistics task, in linguistic tasks, but interestingly also in non-linguistic tasks. And this should really make us think, why should bilingual children be any better than monolinguals in tasks that don't even have anything to do with language? That means that bilingualism has certain effects that go beyond language itself, right? Um, so they used different kinds of tests and found that 
there were no big differences between monolinguals and bilinguals in tasks that targeted spatial reasoning. So here is uh, what is called a mental rotation task. You're supposed to say whether this figure is the same as that one. And the way you do it is you look at this one and then you look at the other one and in your mind you rotate it in such a way until the, the orientation of the two is exactly the same and you notice that yes, they're actually the same figure. Okay, so no big difference uh, between monolinguals and bilinguals with regard to this stuff. But when it comes to logic and symbol manipulation, there's actually uh, substantial differences that can be observed and the bilinguals outperform the monolinguals. Um, so there are a bunch of convergent findings pointing to um, benefits to being bilingual, cognitive benefits. The bilinguals perform better at a variety of non-linguistic tasks and this is commonly linked to something that's called executive control. Executive control is a set of abilities um, the ability to shift and focus attention on different things in your environment, the ability to inhibit stimuli that are not relevant, that are distracting, and also the flexibility to switch between tasks. So bilinguals are better multitaskers than monolinguals. And if you want to, you can get out a piece of paper and write down a few notes. Think for yourself, why should bilinguals be any better at these tasks that don't have anything to do per se with language? Yeah. All right. If you want to do that, um, go ahead. I will continue now. Um, one advantage that bilinguals have is that their metalinguistic abilities are trained and heightened. So bilinguals consciously experience the contrast between two or more languages, and this leads to greater awareness of language itself. As a monolingual, you're like a fish in water. You don't realize that the water around you is something peculiar and special and it, that it could be different. Yeah? Um, but as a bilingual person, you experience different environments and you notice that, well, you can't really take anything for granted. Nothing is normal. Everything is weird in its own way. So this is metalinguistic awareness. You're becoming aware of linguistic forms, their structures, their meanings, and their cross-linguistic equivalents. So you notice what is the same across languages, but more importantly, you actually notice what's different across uh, the, the languages that you speak, and that languages really are weird. So um, a child might comment that French has um, the determiners la and le, but English has only the. Why is that? Why are languages funny like this? Yeah. Okay, um, metalinguistic abilities can be tested in a variety of ways. So, for instance, when you hear an utterance, can you focus separately on its form and on its meaning? If you can, then you have high metalinguistic ability. So here's a little problem that you can try out with children that you know. Uh, it's called the sun-moon problem. And it goes like this. The sun and the moon played a game. They switched their names. Yeah? So they still look the same, but... They were, you know, one was called the name of the other. Um, okay, so given this premise, what would you call the thing that you see in the sky at night? Here, the right answer would be, well, at night you see the sun. Looks like the moon, but it's called something different, namely sun. Um, second question, how would the sky look at night? Well, it would still be dark. Yeah? It's still the moon, but it's just called a different name. Yeah, bilingual children can do this fairly well. Monolingual children have greater difficulty uh, separating form and meaning. Um, so here's a study that tested this formally. Meet Mousy. Yeah? Mousy likes to say silly things. Yesterday she has fallen down the stairs and hit her head. Uh, and now she sometimes says things not the right way. Sometimes she says silly things, but in the right way. And your task is to tell when she says something not the right way. Okay, so this uh, is, is basically a way of explaining to a child that there is semantic oddity. Um, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And that there is structural or grammatical oddity. Right, so children are confronted with the things that Mousy says, some of which are silly, some of which are not silly, some of which are said not the right way. Um, cats have sharp teeth. Two ears you has. 
Who hears you, Harris? Um, apples grow on noses. Yeah, so this is this is silly, right? Um, that's not silly, but it's said not the right way, and that is neither silly nor said not the right way. Yeah, so the crucial stimuli are sentences like these here, which are silly, but said the right way. And uh, bilingual children are actually better at identifying sentences that are silly but said the right way. And the key ability here is to separate information about meaning from information about linguistic structure. Right. Um, here's another study using the famous walk test paradigm. Um, so see on the first picture, this is a wog. Now there's another one, there are two of them, there are two, and the child is supposed to say wogs. Yeah? This has been done to death, and uh, here it's done with different bilingual and monolingual children. And uh, it's found that Chinese English bilinguals and French English bilinguals don't differ from their monolingual peers. But interestingly, Spanish English bilinguals outperform the others. Why would this be? Well, the explanation is that Spanish and English have very similar ways of marking the plural. Yeah? So that there's a strong regularity um, namely uh, uh, an S-type uh, plural that works in comparable ways across both languages. Now, Chinese and English don't work the same way. In French, yes, there's an S, but you can't hear it. So that doesn't give you any advantage if you're a young child. Um, and that means, well, that's the explanation why the Spanish-English bilinguals outperform the other groups at this walk test. <clears throat> okay. Let's talk about literacy a little bit. Is there an effect of bilingualism on the acquisition of literacy? Learning to read and write obviously is a key skill for children and um, reading and writing skills in young children is a very strong predictor of uh, overall success in school during later years. Yeah? So you can actually make reasonable predictions. Um, and this means that if bilingualism makes children pay attention to linguistic form, that should make them better at reading and writing and ultimately should make them more successful in life, shouldn't it? Yeah, so let's let's look at this. Um, oh, wait a second, I need to make this large. So here researchers develop what is called the moving word task. So children were shown pictures like these here, a, a dog and a ball, and then the researcher would get out a card with the word dog on it and say, look, this card has the word dog printed on it. I'm going to put it right here. And then uh, the researcher would put out another card saying, okay, this card now has the word ball printed on it. I'm going to put it right here. And then, well, our friend Mousy, which you met just a minute ago, comes along and Mousy likes to mix up things. So Mousy mixes up these cards and puts them um, into different positions on the table. So now ball is next to dog and dog is next to the picture of the ball and the researcher asks um, okay pointing to this card here uh, can you tell me what's written on this card and it turns out that monolingual four-year-old children are more likely to be distracted by the pictured object so they're more likely to say the name of the thing that they see rather than the word that is printed on the card so in comparison bilingual four-year-old children are more likely to ignore the distracting information. Okay, um, now does bilingualism speed up learning to read? Does it give you an advantage in the temporal dynamics of learning to read? Um, it's well known that there are correlations between phonological awareness and a range of other abilities. So for instance, Spanish phonological awareness um, has a beneficial effect for phonological awareness in a language such as English. The sounds, you know, if you're if you're trained to separate words into component sounds, that is a transferable skill uh, to a different language. Spanish phonological awareness also makes it easier to recognize words in that language, to uh, say things about the spelling of that language, to say things about spelling in another language. Um, so all of these processes and skills are related. And we may wonder, well, what is their relation exactly? So here's a study looking at Chinese English bilingual children, Hebrew English bilingual children, and Spanish English bilingual children. And the question is, does bilingualism advance early literacy? Yeah, so does being bilingual help the children 
start out as early readers. And uh, the Spanish-English bilingual children actually showed benefits of bilingualism compared to monolingual controls, whereas the Chinese-English and Hebrew-English children did not. Now, why is that? There is a fairly um, yeah, uh, straightforward explanation, namely Spanish and English use the same writing system. So if you train in Spanish, uh, you have benefits in English. The same isn't really true for Chinese and English and Hebrew and English. There the writing systems are different, so that means bilingual children have an advantage in reading only if their two languages share a common writing system. All right, that seems commonsensical enough. Uh, let's go back to executive control. I mentioned executive control and how it can be broken down into three main abilities. The first is called inhibitory control, so the ability to ignore information that is there but currently not relevant. Uh, working memory is also uh, relevant here. So <clears throat> in the last video, I talked about working memory. So if you want to catch up, um, that's right in the beginning of the last video. Working memory concerns the ability to hold information in mind for a short time and manipulate that information and committed to working to, to long-term memory if it's really important. And then cognitive flexibility, the ability to switch rapidly between different tasks. That is also part of executive control. It's associated with the prefrontal cortex, so the uh, part of your brain that's right behind your forehead, and it's heightened in bilingual speakers. Okay, um, how do you measure these aspects of executive control? For inhibitory control, there are tasks such as embedded figures tasks. Let me show you an example. Here we have uh, pictures of, well, yeah, see a figure here and then two designs and your task is to tell um, in which of the two designs the figure is embedded so this looks kind of like a tennis ball and you're supposed to say okay is the tennis ball part of this or is it part of that and they kind of look similar so you have to really look closely and see and ignore all the other lines that are part of that design um, right so here I've shown you the I've made it a bit easier for you to recognize what uh, the embedding design is. Um, and in this kind of task, bilingual children actually outperform monolingual children. So even though this has nothing to do with language per se, it has to do with executive control, and that's why the bilingual children are better. Um, bilingual children are also better at something that's called the dimensional change card sort task. Let me show you what this is. So here is a set of cards with different symbols on it and you're supposed to sort after color. So what you're supposed to do is, uh, well, put all the red ones on one stack and all the blue ones on another. And uh, then suddenly there's another set of cards and this time you're supposed to sort after shape. So all the triangles on one stash and all the squares on another yeah so you have to mix different colors and it turns out that monolingual children understand the new rule but <laughs> somehow they keep sorting after color so they find it harder to switch from one regularity to another bilingual children are better at switching to a new rule they're, they're more flexible you know, switching from one thing to another okay um, we could wonder whether these advantages are caused by bilingualism or actually by something else. Yeah? So maybe parents that choose to raise their children bilingually, they could be wealthier, more intelligent, more educated or more ambitious in life. They might have a different outlook on you know, education or I don't know what. Yeah? So this is possible. Maybe the places where bilingual children grow up are more stimulating. So big cities in big cities you're more likely to encounter different languages and somehow this might also be more engaging intellectually than if you live somewhere i don't know uh hidden under a rock in a big forest where nothing ever happens well we don't know but we can test yeah uh, so here's a experiment that has been done um, with monolinguals and then two different types of bilinguals um, of the, the same kind of background. Um, the task itself is called the faces task and it works in such a way that okay on a screen you see a face that looks kind of scary and then the eyes light up in red zombie 
and then there's nothing, and then there's a star. And um, you have to remember, if the eyes you saw were red and the star appears, then you have to press a key that's on the same side as the star. Yeah? There's a different condition where the eyes are green, and then the star appears, and then you have to press a key that's actually at the opposite side of the star. So red eyes, star, same side. Uh, green eyes, star, opposite side. Simple, right? Uh, interestingly, the bilinguals can do this better. And um, I've actually repeated this with uh, students of mine have, have repeated this kind of study and uh, the bilinguals do better. That's this is amazing. Yeah, and uh, what's even more amazing is that this holds true across different cultural environments. So we have bilinguals from Canada and from India who um, perform exactly the same. Yeah? And here the black bars, those are the reaction times of the monolingual Canadians, which share the cultural environment with the bilingual Canadians, uh, but nonetheless perform a lot worse. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> let's also talk about advantages of bilingualism across the lifespan. Uh, there's a paradigm that's called the Simon task that I want to show you. And it kind of works like the faces task, but um, it doesn't involve scary faces. So here you have, uh, again, two buttons that you have as response buttons. And when you see a red square on the screen, you have to press the left key. And when you see a green square, you have to press the right key. Okay, so put your fingers in front of I don't know, your, your keyboard. Um, okay, red square, red square, left key, green square, right key. Here we see a red square, that means uh, you should press the left key. And this is what is called an incongruent condition. So the square is on the right, but red means press on the left. And so this, this means you have to juggle these different ideas. Um, if you see a green square on the right, well, you press the right button. So this is called the congruent condition. And if there's a green square on the left, that means you still have to press the right. That's incongruent again. It turns out that, um, well, bilinguals are better at responding to incongruent trials. So they're better at disentangling these different types of information. This is called the Simon effect. And the Simon effect is there for bilinguals of all ages. And it becomes stronger in old age. This is not because the bilinguals become much better, but it's rather because the monolinguals, they really deteriorate at this, so that they find it really, really more difficult the older they get. So the older you get, the more difficult it becomes to execute, to, to, to execute inhibitory control. But if you're bilingual, this decay of inhibitory control is slowed down. So you age more gracefully if you are a bilingual speaker. That's great, yeah? Okay, here's another similar uh, paradigm that's called the attentional network task. It's a bit more elaborate than the, the, the Simon task because here there's a variety of cues that participants see early on in the trials. Yeah? And these cues may indicate the location of an upcoming stimulus. So <clears throat> there are trials with no cue, so just a fixation cross. There are <clears throat> uh, trials with a star that's in the center. Uh, there are trials with two stars, so that leaves it sort of open where the, um, where the stimulus might appear. There are spatial cues, you know, star towards the top of the screen, at the bottom of the screen, uh, indicating where an upcoming stimulus might be. Right, and then the stimuli that people actually have to respond to are these uh, configurations of arrows. So participants see five arrows in a row. Um, and there are three conditions as a neutral condition. So four lines in one arrow. And there are there's a congruent condition where all the arrows point in the same direction. That's the congruent condition. And an incongruent condition where there's one arrow in the middle pointing in a different direction than the other. So the question in each case is, where does the middle arrow point? Yeah, And you can kind of, well, you, uh, it's, it's no big surprise that it's easier to respond to neutral and congruent 
uh, trials than to incongruent trials because there you have to ignore this conflicting information of you know, some arrows pointing in that direction, some arrow, uh, you know, the one in the middle is the one that you really need to pay attention to. Okay, so the overall design of the attentional network task is that first you see a fixation cross, then there's a queue uh, that just blinks very quickly, and then you see the target. Yeah, so this is one of the confusing targets with conflicting information, but the spatial cue is reliable here. Yeah, so you see the star, and that makes you focus already on the right position of the stimulus. There are also um, <clears throat> uh, trials with an unreliable spatial cue. So here we have a cue, and the stimulus actually shows up here, makes it more difficult, and on top of that, it's also incongruent, so more difficult still. Um, the results of experiments like this uh, are shown in this graph here. So there are differences across the three different conditions. So neutral and congruent are relatively more, more easy uh, than incongruent. So this is regardless of the kind of cue that appears earlier. But you see that reliable spatial cues are really the, the, the best um, help that participants can get. So the reliable spatial cue in the neutral and congruent condition that yields to the fastest responses and then no spatial cue or unreliable spatial cues um, that leads to the longest latencies in the incongruent condition. Importantly for us, bilinguals outperform monolinguals at the attentional network test. So you see that uh, here are the uh, times for the congruent trials and these are the times for the incongruent trials and uh, in both types of conditions the bilinguals are actually faster than the monolinguals. Right. Um, one last item that I want to discuss, namely coming back to this question, can learning a second language uh, prevent dementia? Well, maybe not prevent, but delay. Um, so here's a study with uh, 211 patients, out of which 102 were bilingual, 109 monolingual, and all of them were diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease. And the groups were the same on measures of cognitive and occupational level. So all of the controls that were not there in the, the early bilingual study here, everything was properly controlled for. And the dependent variable was how old were the patients when Alzheimer's was diagnosed. And the result was that bilingual patients, on average, had been diagnosed uh, 4.3 years later, and their symptoms only kicked in 5.1 years later than in the monolingual patients. So that means that, well, bilingualism can't really save you from dementia, but it can weaken the impact of a disease like that. There was no effect of immigration status, no gender differences, so all that was controlled for, meaning that it's really bilingualism and the training of using several languages alongside each other that has this effect. So lifelong bilingualism confers protection against the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So with that in mind, you know, pick up a second language and start today. Summing up. Um, early views on bilingualism were negative, but these have been roundly discarded. So by now, there's a wealth of evidence pointing the other way. Bilingualism has many cognitive benefits, even in areas that don't have anything to do with language per se. Bilingual children have smaller vocabularies in each of their languages than monolingual children, but um, bilingualism really boosts executive control, and this leads to the cognitive benefits that we see. So there are three main abilities. Inhibitory control, the ability to ignore information that is currently not relevant. Um, working memory, the ability to hold information in mind for a short time and manipulate that. Um, and cognitive flexibility, the ability to switch rapidly between tasks. All of this is part of executive control and it's heightened in bilingual speakers. All right, so that's kind of good news. And on this positive note, I uh, let you go. Au revoir. See you then.